men have searched for the Ark of the Covenant in order to unlock its secrets. But what was the Ark and the immense power that it contained? And why did it kill some of those who touched it? Was it an object of divine power? Or could it have been a man-made device? Come with me as I investigate who Moses really was and unravel the ancient science behind the most famous holy relic of all. The book of Exodus in the Bible is very clear on how to build the Ark of the Covenant. The box had to be made of hard chitim wood, or acacia as it's known today, 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches deep, and then lined inside and out with pure gold. A solid gold mercy seat, or lid, was to be placed on top of the Ark, upon which perched two gold winged cherubs facing each other with their wings spread. Two wooden carrying poles were then passed through gold rings on either side of the box to allow it to be carried safely. But the Bible also says the ark erupted in a shower of sparks and flames, killing those who touched it and laying waste armies. Clearly this was no ordinary carrying chest. I'm here in the Sinai Desert, amid thousands of square miles of just sand and scrub. According to the Bible, more than 3,000 years ago, Moses stood here and received instructions from God to build the Ark of the Covenant, a wooden box covered in pure gold in which to place two stone tablets bearing the Ten Commandments. But no one really knows what the Ark was. One scientist has a controversial theory he believes that it was a capacitor or a battery of sorts. Wild as it may sound, we're gonna build a full-scale replica and then try to fire it up to see if we can produce an electrical current. To unravel this ancient mystery, scientist John Hutchison has put together a team in Vancouver who are all experts in their fields, including cabinet maker Dan Northrup and electrical engineer Corey Whaling. Together, they have to design, build, and test a working replica of the Ark using the Bible as their instruction manual. But why was the Ark so deadly? Highly controversial theories suggest that it might have contained particles from a meteorite. Others speculate that it was a nuclear device of some sort, made of highly radioactive uranium. John Hutchison's belief is no less controversial, but much more practical. He believes that it might have been a high-voltage capacitor, part of some lost ancient technology. According to his theory, when it was carried across the hot desert, the two gold cherubs on top of the box collected huge amounts of static and electromagnetic electricity, causing the entire outside of the arc to be negatively charged. With the hard acacia wood acting as an insulator between them, the inside of the box, also gold-lined, would have become positively charged and would have been able to build up and store a lethal voltage, zapping anyone who touched it. If this theory is true, then 3,000 years ago, this would have indeed seemed like God in a box. It'll build up thousands of volts of energy and discharge like a huge spark like that. It can actually kill you if you're not careful with it. You're not going to get hurt. You're going to get killed. It's, there's no, there's no, ooh, it might be harmful. It'll kill you. And anybody that touched it would have got kicked across the room. So, while the team in Vancouver are battling to build it, I'm going to stay out here in Egypt and try to piece together the ancient heritage behind it. And we've only got four weeks to do it. Dan has bought long planks of raw milled Canadian acacia, which he now needs to cut down to size. Based on the ancient measurement of cubits in the Bible, 
He's calculated it will be 27 inches high, 27 inches wide, by 45 inches across. The base drawing I came up with of the simplest form, what I think the Ark of the Covenant would start out as, which is very similar to a modern blanket box. And then to further assist, I've done more of a detailed drawing, which shows the um, joinery and a simple joinery system, which I believe will require very little fasteners or glue, all being made of wood. And then a third portion, uh, roughly dictating what it might look like gilded with gold. My further research this morning in the Bible, I went back to the uh, time of Exodus, as I have several times the instructions for the sizes, the materials, two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold and make there too a crown of gold around it. We took all the measurements and stuff, a lot of it came right out of the Bible. So we're trying to, here, there's your negative earth. Negative outer layer. That's a, yeah. Talks about it floating. Dan Northrup is a master craftsman. His work includes handmade cabinets, desks, and tables for film stars, politicians, and even royal families. At heart, though, he says he's just a wood freak. I've worked on thousands of pieces that have been built from 300 to 400 years ago. I've duplicated pieces from those eras. I've never had the chance to duplicate something from 3,000 years ago. <laughs> nice and tight. A little bit of movement. We got it. John Hutchison is a maverick scientist specializing in electromagnetic currents and has been fascinated by the arc for as long as he can remember. In the 1980s, he pioneered a project to investigate the effects of intense electromagnetic electricity on different materials. The results were surprising, with reports of metal disks levitating off laboratory tables, wooden planks fusing together with metal rods, solid metal balls liquefying, and heavy apparatus lifting off the floor. The experiments became known as the Hutchison effect. Although controversy still surrounds his work in this field, there are many scientists who have validated Hutchison's pioneering research. I'm reading some articles on the internet about Moses that he was basically also electrical genius and felt that if he could have a special machine, a special arc, beautiful, actually quite a beautiful piece, and it produced these sparks that he could indeed carry, the, let's say, the word of God or Jesus through by showing this off as an energy source, but not understanding exactly what it is. Yeah, these are the cherubim drawings. That's what they're, that's a base sketch of them. Yeah. This is a more detailed sketch of the wing. So that sits on top of the box. Yeah, you sit on top of the mercy seat. Anybody who would experience sparks out of it or coming between the cherubim or weird glows coming from it would indeed say that God has, to, has something to do with it. Corey Whaling is an electrical engineer who specializes in high voltage transformers. He's convinced the arc was some form of ancient capacitor. It could have very well built a charge from these from the priests carrying it through the desert by the clothing they're wearing, the heat and the friction, the friction of their, you know, their legs rubbing together, the furs they used to protect themselves from the box. All of that could have built a static charge and it could have been captured in the ark as a capacitor. While Dan mills the timber, John hits Vancouver's junkyards to find parts and materials to build the electrical apparatus. Well, I'm looking for bits and pieces for the ark. Maybe some cherubim, if I'm lucky. Looking. The two angels on top of the ark were known as cherubs 
and had their wings outstretched. And although the Bible mentions solid gold, any highly conductive metal will do. Well, my thing against scrapyards is it's already made, and the price is right. And you get something like this that would probably cost 800 bucks to 1,000 for $30. I, I think it's a bargain. You have to do some modifications on it. That's why I like military surplus and scrapyards to get the best for less. <laughs> While John Hutchison and the team in Vancouver battle against the clock to build a full-size replica of the Ark of the Covenant, I've come back to Egypt, the country of my ancestors, to try to unlock the secrets of this enigmatic box. As a journalist and writer with a fascination for ancient Egypt, I'm going to investigate what the Ark really was, and the highly controversial theory that it may have produced some sort of high voltage electricity thousands of years before it was thought to have been invented by modern science. The earliest known battery was discovered in 1938 in Baghdad, Iraq. It was a small clay pot containing an iron rod and some vinegar, which produced less than one volt of electricity. Enough to electroplate metal maybe, but hardly the shower of sparks and flames the Bible describes. The Baghdad battery, as it became known, was dated to 250 BC. No one has ever found any electrical devices or batteries dating back to the time of Moses, a thousand years earlier. I'm heading to the temple of Hathor in Dendera. It's about an hour north of the Valley of the Kings to check out some remarkable hieroglyphics that I think might change that. This was one of the most important temples in ancient Egypt. It had the largest alchemical library in the kingdom and was a center of science, medicine, and learning. It also houses some of the best preserved and most intriguing wall reliefs ever discovered. In the heart of the temple was the Holy of Holies, an inner sanctum which was only accessible to the high priests and the pharaoh himself. This is where they performed their alchemy, transmutated metals, interpreted dreams. This is where the magic went down, and all the secrets are etched on the walls around me. Like this ark, look at it. There's a box with wood carrying poles. It looks exactly like the Ark of the Covenant. And although we don't know its exact purpose, it's very possible that it was an integral part of their magical ceremonies. But the real secrets of Zendera were hidden underground in the oldest part of the temple and only recently discovered. Underneath the temple, deep in the crypt, are supposedly these mysterious hieroglyphics first found by British Egyptologist Alan Alford in the 90s. It was him who thought that they looked like ancient Egyptian electricity. I think these might be them. Yes. It's amazing. If you look, these definitely look like huge light bulbs. And they're going into cables right here. And then on the other side, looks very industrial, are these transformers. It's very compelling evidence. Could this be evidence of ancient Egyptian electricity? Carrying 
poles. And the cherubim. Alrighty. I'll give you a call when I get some some more research. Okay. Bye. So, it's possible that the Egyptians were familiar with electricity, but what about the Ark of the Covenant? Golden chests like these on carrying poles appear on dozens of tombs throughout Egypt, and they're strikingly similar in shape, design, and size to the Ark of the Covenant. When the tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered in 1922, Howard Carter found a large number of ceremonial boxes built to contain stone effigies of their gods, including one made of gold with two carrying poles and the god of death, Anubis, lying on the top. Could the Ark of the Covenant be modeled on this? Even more intriguing was the young pharaoh's coffin over which hung a large cloth tent interwoven with thousands of small bronze stars, surrounded by winged cherubim, very similar to the description of the tabernacle in the Bible. Dr. Hani Ragab is the curator of the Pharaonic Museum in Cairo and an expert on the Tutankhamun treasures. The Ark of the Covenant was very much an ancient Egyptian artistic piece, mm -hmm. description-wise. And then the second thing is the, the Ten Commandments, which are believed to be the first law given to man. Uh, seven of those Ten Commandments are in the Book of the Dead that existed long before the Jews came to Egypt. It seems possible that whoever wrote the description of the Ark in the Bible must have known about the ceremonial boxes and funeral rituals of ancient Egypt. Back in Vancouver, Dan's ready with the wood and is now beginning to assemble the box. This is about half of the lumber that's going to be involved in the box, and I'd say we're well over 100 pounds at this point. When you tie things together, pulls, Cherubims, carcasses, I'd definitely say we're going to be at least 500 pounds. Well, you're going to see the tenon on the top, and you're going to see it on the bottom, but once it's done, you won't see it because the box will be on it and the molding will be on it. Okay. Where we've got our mercy seat, top of the box, where the cherubims are going to sit, pretty much ready to go. of the Egyptians at this point. The things I am finding is they used very limited tools to do a lot of work. So in that sense, I don't think things have changed all that much. need the orders from Mr. Hutchinson. While Dan and Corey work on the Ark, John goes back to his apartment, which he's transformed into a high-voltage lab. Okay, to the door. Welcome to John's World, or John's Paradise, or John's Paradise. That strange world of John. The ancient Egyptians were using voltaics and different metals and also possibly electrostatics. And I think they even had light, crude light bulbs from what I'm told. John's built a scale model of the Ark using the same acacia wood, but two brass eagles instead of angels. 
He's attached the box to a powerful transformer to test how it will react to a high voltage charge. Even here, the dangers are very real. I've heard a story 30 years ago from a radio broadcaster where they built a replica of the Ark in a, in a <clears throat> university and this thing actually electrocuted somebody and the project was shelved because it was too dangerous. The cherubim with their wings outstretched over the mercy seat act as spark gaps, really, because they're so close together, which means that they could carry a, a spark right across them and cause a glow effect to come down onto the highly polished gold mercy seat and you'd see all this magical light, light in that, like a mirror. One of the more controversial theories on the Great Pyramid at Giza is that it was an energy source built at a specific location to harness a strong, natural, electromagnetic field, like other ancient sites such as Glastonbury and Machu Picchu. According to these theories, the King's Chamber inside the Great Pyramid functioned like a huge capacitor and stored this charge, causing those inside to have out-of-body experiences. Could this really be true? I had to find out for myself. Arriving early in the morning, the pyramid was opened especially for us, and I was allowed in on my own. You can't imagine how massive this structure is until you're actually inside and climbing up the main shaft. Some experts say this was a tomb, but others believe that it was used for rebirth and regeneration. One thing's for sure, it's a long ways up to the king's chamber. What I find the most intriguing about the king's chamber is this basin here. It's made out of quartz and granite, and it's the same cubic capacity as the Ark of the Covenant. 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches deep. What was it used for? Could it have been that the Ark of the Covenant was placed in here, and that's how the pyramid came to life? I didn't have an out-of-body experience here, but there is a strange feeling, a strange kind of energy. It's tempting to speculate that the granite basin was indeed some form of rebirthing pool, its natural quartz crystals and this whole chamber somehow brought to life by a power source. But without any proof, speculation, it must remain. We're going to Luxor, we're taking the overnight. Should be interesting, 10 hours. And hopefully no bed bugs. There are no tourists on this train. There's mostly locals. I guess all of them are going to Luxor. While Egypt trundled past the window outside, I hit the bar. If you ever take the overnight sleeper from Cairo to Luxor, take it from me. It's the place to break up the 10-hour journey. 70s decor, neat spirits, and a dancing barman. Oh, and a fold-down bed, all for just $50. As 
dawn breaks, we arrive in Luxor, the ancient capital of Thebes. I've come here to meet a man who has been on a similar quest to me. Author Ahmed Osman has long been a thorn in the side of the Egyptian Antiquities Department with his outspoken views on the Exodus. He believes that Moses was the pharaoh Akhenaten. Just as the Bible says Moses did, Akhenaten believed in one God and fled Egypt with his followers to the Sinai Desert. I believe in my own research, according to my own argument and research, that Akhenaten, the king who declared only one God, the, the monotheistic king, and closed all the temples who ruled Egypt in the mid 14th century, I believe that Akhenaten was the historical Moses. So therefore, do you think that the Ark of the Covenant was Egyptian? The Ark of the Covenant was an Egyptian uh, object used in worship, and it is certainly, you can find it all over the place, in Tutankhamun's tomb, all over the place. It is exactly the way Moses explained it in the Book of Exodus. Why would Akhenaten create this box of tricks? People needed a, a powerful leader, and they needed to, to be sure that this leader does represent a bigger power, a superpower. And obviously these uh, images and tricks help to enhance the position of the leader. Why do you think Akhenaten would create this box of tricks, like, you know, sparks coming out of it? He hasn't the created it, he used it. And obviously because of gold, uh, uh, covered by gold and so on, it must have had some this reflection. And they could, as all other Egyptian elements of, of worship, have used some chemical material or electric material to shine and give some kind of sound or, or, or image that can give an effect of, of some powerful deity. These boxes, these arcs, which used to carry the holy objects, the holy figures sometimes, and covered with figures of cherubim, angel, angelic figures and so on, and carried by four priests, are found in every place in, in, in Egypt, especially in Tut Tutankhamun. Are there other things that, that the Hebrews took out from the ancient Egyptian practices? The Hebrews took many things from it. Even the Ten Commandments are Egyptian. I mean, in the Book of the Dead, you have this uh, thing. When, when, when the deceased goes to be judged, you usually have a negative thing. I haven't done that. I haven't stolen. I haven't killed. I haven't done that. But in the, in the book, in the, in the Ten Commandments, you have it in the positive thing. I don't kill, in the imperative, don't kill, don't steal, exactly the same moralities of the ancient Egyptian from, not only that, they also have the, the, the idea of, of, of the snake, the holy snake, the rod of Moses. It is an Egyptian. Why would he do that? To impress the audience, the worshippers. <laughs> because God is powerful and is mysterious as well. And these priests know the mystery of God and they have to impress the audience that this is the power, you see. You know, ancient time, ordinary people need some mystery to get into belief. Do you think that Serebit al Hadam? do you think that that's the actual Sinai as opposed to St. Catherine's you see, You see, the Israeli archaeologists who were digging uh, during the occupation of, of, of Sinai from Egypt, uh, digging the area, they they found the remains of this temple on the top of Mount uh, Sarabit. And this was a very ancient temple of the local people of, of Midianites in Sinai. It was a holy place from the old time. Certainly, certainly, this Sarabit is one of the holy sites of the Bible. But we certainly know from archaeological evidence that there was a holy temple on the top of the Mount of Sarabit al Khadi, and that there are lots of indication to confirm that Akhenaten lived there for some time. Pitri found in the, at the end of, of the 19th century, he found the head of Queen Tai, Akhenaten's mother, in this temple. And he found ev evidence also in the temple of some kind of uh, Semitic worship with a lot of, uh, of burnt offerings and so on. So certainly Sarabit al was the place where I think that 
Akhenaten lived during his exile in Sinai. Why are there so many discrepancies in the Bible? Like, for instance, I've read that certain books were completely taken out of the Bible. Mainly because the story of the Bible was transmitted orally for many centuries before it was put down in writing in 6th century BC in Babylon. The Bible, as it is now, was put in writing eight centuries after the time of Moses, mainly from different transmitted orally stories. So there is some kind of confusion sometimes, and sometimes if even some information contradicting each other. However, if we examine the evidence against the historical background, we can reach a, a definite kind of conclusion. Couldn't it be also the, the people who wrote it, the many people who wrote the Bible, it had to fit a certain narrative. They had, I mean, it had to fit the story. So things that didn't go with, with history were taken out for their own, maybe they had ulterior motives, could it be? Different tribes, different uh, writers, different times had different accounts and different reasons for this account. However, with biblical archaeology now, we can, we can re-examine the evidence and come to a conclusion. It does not mean, because the Bible had different contradicting stories, that there is no fact behind it. There is certainly historical core for the biblical story. I think the time has come that we look in history to find the biblical characters. Because so far we have been separating between the Bible and Quran, the holy books, uh, and history. I mean, if these characters, Moses, Joseph, and all these characters, were real historical characters, then we should be able to find evidence from history and archaeology to prove the, the time they lived and how they lived and so on. Just one week to go now till our deadline expires. Time to check in with Vancouver. Good morning. Hey, Dan. It's Miriam. I know, I know I'm probably waking you up, but I wanted to know how the arc is going. Uh, pretty good to this point. Uh, the box is together. We're just working on the top, and uh, there's a few little things with uh, the electrical guys that need to be worked out to finish the last bit of molding. Besides that, the box is going great. Okay. I have to uh, contour the staves, the carrying poles. All right. I'll call you a little bit later when you're more awake. Okay, bye. I've seen what looks like early forms of electric current on the walls underneath the Temple of Dendera, and I've seen dozens of arc-like golden chests and tombs. Could they really be connected, and how? If Moses really was the Pharaoh Akhenaten, then the answer could be out here in the Sinai Desert, in the ruins of the temple. All I had to do was find it. The Bible says that the Ark of the Covenant was constructed on Mount Sinai, where St. Catherine's Monastery is today. But that was built in the fourth century AD, nearly 2,000 years after Moses. However, in 1904, a British archeologist, Flinders Petrie, came across an Egyptian temple at Serebit el Khedem, a short distance away, which was dated back to the time of Moses and the Exodus from Egypt. was dated back to 2600 BC. Why was there a major ancient Egyptian temple so far away from Thebes, built on a remote mountaintop? Surely this ties into the theory that Pharaoh Akhenaten fled and set up court in exile, where he and his followers could worship their one god, Aten. And this is very similar to the story in the Bible of Moses. When Petrie excavated the site, he found evidence of furnaces, crucibles, and tools, as well as a large amount of white powder mixed with sand. This was clearly much more than just a temple. 
Had Petrie found Akhenaten's alchemical workshop? A place of science and worship? Could this possibly have been where the Ark of the Covenant was built? to explore a controversial theory that the Ark of the Covenant might have been an electrical capacitor, I found it's quite possible the Ark was Egyptian in design and that it could have been made in Sinai. It's also possible it might have been used by the Egyptian high priests in the temples. But the question remains, what was it used for? There's an Egyptian working in the Valley of the Kings who may have the answer. Ibrahim Mohammed Ali Rabi is the head of one of the oldest families in Gurna. And there is now, there is few family. His great-grandfather helped excavate in the Valley of the Kings, and his detailed knowledge of the area has been passed down through generations. We live in the tombs of the noble here. The Gurna people, when they come, they used to live inside the tombs, and they start to build their houses outside the tombs. And we know there is, especially in the tombs of the noble, they have so much secret about power. Working in the tombs of the nobles, which have been largely abandoned by modern archaeologists, Ibrahim has spent years analyzing the mummies and researching the burial rituals of the high priests. Controversially, he believes the art may have been used to produce a very fine powdered gold known as mufskst, or life which he's found in many of the mummies of the nobles. He thinks the powder was produced by exposing the naturally mined gold to great heat inside or on the ark. And although there's no proof that this was the case, the scientific theory is possible. Here used to be a, a stone door has been locked and sealed and uh, painted. So nobody knows, this is used to be a secret place for the powder jar. Here we are in a secret place where they used to put a uh, golden powder and the white powder inside the jar. And this inside the jar used to be in one of these small rooms here inside. But the jars are broken, so Did someone you? stole what was inside. Yes, yeah, somebody broke them, actually, because they found them sealed. Mm. They mm. don't know the secret. Yeah. Uh, they just broke them. Somebody's arm. Oh, my God. See oh how God. big. Wow. And it's heavy because of all the medicine, herb, and the gold inside. It's believed this powder was given to the dead to give them strength in their journey to the underworld and the afterlife. If the Ark was used to produce this venerated powder of life, it's easy to see how it gained almost mythical status, and why, for the Hebrews, it became a powerful symbol of their god. Was the mufsks the manna from heaven that the Bible describes being placed inside the Ark alongside the Ten Commandments? Was it true that powdered gold had these amazing properties? Hello? Miriam, how are you doing? I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. While I'm doing my research, I came across something called Mufskst, and it's supposed to be this, this high um, spun gold. I know about the special uh, white Powder. There's been a lot of interest in the scientific community about it. They refer to it in the scientific community as monatomic elements. Yeah. It's white powder that is found in mining areas, and they analyze it and find that it contains gold, the salts of gold. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, this is good. I'm having a lot of fun on the project. 
and I hope everything over there in Egypt's okay. You're very welcome, and have a great evening or day, whatever it is over there. I'll be in touch with you. Have the progress. All right. Bye. Bye. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Drawings of what we should have in the box. Hey. Actually, looking kind of neat. With the two brass cherubs now on site, Dan puts the finishing touches to the art, adding the intricate hand-carved moldings and panels, as well as the carrying poles. Although the Bible does say it was lined inside and out with pure gold, the team estimated it would cost more than $10 million, not to mention the weight. If it had a nine inch slab of gold on top, which is one, eight, nine, whatever, if it had a solid slab of gold that was three feet by five feet, plus the box, plus all the other gold, plus the chair bumps, it would have to be close to two tons. How many guys did this thing carry? Four. Four. That's what, I, I believe people were a lot stronger back then, but two tons? To turn this wooden box into a capacitor, they're putting two layers of copper plates inside the box, separated by a large sheet of insulation material. Each layer would be one plate of the capacitor. And when it's charged, one would develop a positive charge, one would develop a negative charge, and the energy would actually be stored in the insulator uh, as a, a static electricity. While John, Dan, and the team made their final preparations to the Ark in Vancouver, I spent my last night in Luxor, sitting around the fire with the men of Gorna. Men who'd grown up in the tombs of the pharaohs, whose ancestors had built them, and who'd actually seen the great treasures before they were looted, and who knows, maybe even a golden Ark or two. Listening to the music and their adventures, I realized how little had changed here for thousands of years. Okay. Finally, after exhaustive adjustments, rigorous safety checks, and many, many sleepless nights, the team's ready to test their full-scale replica of the Ark of the Covenant. The team has tried to be as true to the Bible's instructions as possible. Dan has used acacia throughout, a very similar hardwood to the chittim wood that the Bible describes. And like his ancient counterparts, Dan hasn't used any nails at all, just joinery. The Bible describes the Ark erupting in a shower of sparks and flames, laying waste armies and killing all those who touched it. The team's expectations are more modest than that, but they do expect to see a good spark of electricity between the two cherubs. Although the Bible also says the Ark had to be lined inside and out with pure gold, the cost of this would have been over $10 million today. So instead, the replica is lined inside with copper sheets. The two brass cherubs are attached to metal rods which lead down into the box. The team believes the Ark charged itself when it was carried through the desert for weeks on end. They think the heat and the friction would have built up a huge charge inside the box. To replicate this, John's attached the Ark to a powerful transformer, which will provide 50,000 volts of electricity. If his calculations are correct, the copper chamber inside the box will charge up and then spark between the wings of the two cherubim. I think they'll actually put on quite a light show. You don't want to touch it. Definitely do not want to go anywhere within feet of it, really, when it's arcing. 
This power is the primary energy here, here, this one here. Cables again. Okay, he's connected. Why have I got this here? Anything can happen, I guess. So you're not concerned then? Oh, that'd be fun. What the hell? Why not? You only live once, right? Let her rip. The experiment did seem to be a success. The arc did charge up like a capacitor, and the cherubim did spark between their wings before bursting into flames. Even in a warehouse in Vancouver, it's easy to see how people saw this as God in a box 3,000 years ago. That's a lot of energy to do that. That's mega, mega, mega voltage. <laughs> so say? Did it go as you kind of thought it would go? Yeah, it would run pretty good, I think. Pretty dynamic, and pretty powerful. To blow them up like that, that's a lot of energy. <laughs> Ooh. How do you feel now that it's over? I feel I'm re ready to build four kitchens and a dining room set. It did work. I don't know if we proved it. it killed people or threw fire at people, but you know we proved it's possible that it could have been a capacitor. I got a couple more trees so we can build another one. Although Hutchison's theory is controversial, the team may have moved closer to proving the arc was an electrical capacitor of some sort, perhaps connected to what looked like the ancient light bulbs and electrical equipment we found on the tomb walls. But we may never know for sure. Like so much in this ancient land, the arc could have been part of a lost technology, a lost knowledge, enshrined on the walls of tombs and temples for thousands of years, which we're only today beginning to unlock and understand. <laughs>